Good morning. The committee will come to order. We begin by welcoming our newest member of Congress, Mike Quigley from Chicago, Illinois, to the Committee on the Judiciary. He was elected on April 7th to the seat that our former colleague Rahm Emanuel vacated when he became the president, uh, uh, when he became <laughs> President Obama's chief of staff. <laughs> quick, quick I'm trying to get in good with Rahm Emanuel. He's lived in Chicago area for almost 30 years. He began his political career as a community activist. Gosh, that's a popular job description these days. In the suburb of Lakeview. Later, he worked for Chicago Alderman Bernie Hansen in the 80s. He also earned a law degree from Loyola where he has more recently been an adjunct professor in the political science department, as well as a master's in the public policy from the University of Chicago. In the 1990s, he was a criminal defense attorney trying over 200 cases. For the last 10 years, he was a Cook County commissioner representing communities mostly along the north shore of Lake Michigan, most of which are in his new congressional district. He established a record on the commission as the, quote, the greenest elected official in Chicago, end quote, in the words of his local newspaper, by not only supporting pro-environment policy, but walking the walk regularly, going out personally on cleanup projects in the state's forest preserves. He's a champion for civil rights as well as fiscal responsibility and open government. Uh, he claims to be an, an accomplished ice hockey player, <laughs> and I understand he's gotten several stitches over the <laughs> course of his ice hockey career. We don't get that rough in the Judiciary Committee. Uh, we're a nonviolent group, but I'm glad to know that we have such a determined player in our midst who will not be uh, intimidated by some of the things that go on in uh, our full committee. He's been assigned to the Subcommittee on Crime, the Subcommittee on Courts and Competition, I yield to Lamar Smith if he wanted to add to this welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, would like to uh, welcome Mike Quigley to the Judiciary Committee. And, Mike, I checked your website uh, <laughs> and saw how you identified yourself. And it came to my attention that you identify yourself first as independent and fiscally responsible before you identify yourself as a community activist. <laughs> and so I am going to choose to emphasize the former and de-emphasize the latter. <laughs> In any case, we're glad you're here. And I also notice you were, a, as the chairman just mentioned, a county commissioner. Uh, that makes three of us in Congress by my count, so I appreciate the uh, experience you've had in that capacity as well. Uh, welcome to the- Welcome, Judiciary. Mike Quigley. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if, if you'd like to make a comment, you may. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I do want to recognize that uh, Congressman Danny Davis was also a member of the Cook County Board prior to my being there. And I served with uh, uh, Commissioner Jerry Iceman Butler. So I'm, I'm not sure that'll tip off how I'm going to vote today or not. But uh, he's a very good man, and I'm glad to be here. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Welcome aboard, sir. We now turn to the resolution expanding the responsibilities of our Judicial Impeachment Task Force to also include an inquiry into whether United States District Judge Samuel B. Kent, the Southern District of Texas, should be impeached. Pursuant to notice, I call up the resolution for purposes of markup. Oh. Members all have a copy of the resolution. Without objection, the resolution is considered as read and open for consideration or amendment at any point. Uh, Judge Kent was sentenced on Monday 
of this week to 33 months in prison, having pled guilty to obstruction of justice for lying during the investigation into his sexual misconduct. As part of his plea agreement, five separate counts for sexual assaults and misconducts ag uh, misconduct against both a secretary in his office and a case manager were dropped, but he admitted on the record that the sexual contact had been against both women's will. Although Judge Kent is headed to prison, he remains a federal judge and will continue to collect a salary unless he resigns or is impeached. Pursuant to House Resolution 424, which passed the House only last night by unanimous consent, we were given this committee the same authority to conduct an inquiry into whether Judge Kent should be impeached as we previously had with respect to Judge Porteous. The resolution before us simply amends the resolution we adopted in the committee in January for the Judge Porteous inquiry to also include the Judge Kent inquiry in the task force responsibility. The authorities that apply to the task force uh, inquiry regarding Judge Porteous will obviously also apply to the new inquiry rege regarding Judge Kent, and the membership will remain the same. I'd like to turn now to Lamar Smith, our ranking member, for any comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm glad we were able to work together to address this troubling situation. Uh, you've already covered the facts, so I'll ask unanimous consent that my uh, opening statement be made a part of the record. Without objection, and so with that, I'll yield back. Chairman. Yes, who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Chairman Emeritus Sensenbrenner. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentlemen's recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yesterday I introduced a resolution of impeachment against Judge Kent. Uh, I did so after giving him 24 hours after the sentencing to contemplate the fact that uh, when he goes to jail, he will be drawing a full judicial salary and performing no judicial functions as a convicted felon, and that the time has come for him to resign. Uh, evidently, he's not going to resign. Uh, he's going to try to uh, uh, be allowed to, quote, retire on disability. Uh, it puzzles me how pleading guilty to a crime involving obstruction of justice relating to sexual harassment and potential sexual assault uh, criminal charges uh, against his employee is a disability that would allow one to retire on full salary. All of that being said, I am glad that uh, the chair and the ranking member uh, have introduced this resolution, which I enthusiastically support. I would submit, however, that given the fact that Judge Kent will be incarcerated beginning next month, that dealing with the Kent situation is a matter of urgency, because if we delay, he will be able to get away with drawing a full judicial salary while sitting in prison. This is different than the Judge Porteous situation in that Judge Kent has pleaded guilty, uh, has thus been convicted, and has been sentenced uh, to a term in prison. And that's why I think that the issue is one that is clearer, that is one that is easier for this committee to decide to do the right thing, whereas the Porteous situation is much more complicated and requires more uh, investigation. So in supporting this resolution, let me strongly admonish the chair and other members of the committee that we ought to deal with the Judge Kent situation uh, expeditiously uh, in a way that behooves the committee to uh, uh, discharge its responsibilities and eliminates the need for the House to deal with the privilege resolution should Judge Kent go to prison without having resigned. Would the gentleman I, yield? Thank I, I, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Gallagher. Just, just for a 10-second question. Uh, uh, Jim, are you aware of what, the, or maybe someone else on the committee would know, the time pending before he is uh, incarcerated, the 30 days or 45 days, however many days it is, uh, is he allowed to continue to sit on the bench? And, uh, does anyone know? Uh, well, the, the answer is, is that 
Yeah, the Chief Judge of the Fifth Circuit, Judge Edith Jones, uh, uh, took him out of hearing criminal cases when he was indicted. He was hearing civil cases, but uh, Judge Jones either can or already has uh, already prohibited him from uh, uh, hearing any cases whatsoever. But he remains a federal district judge uh, because the Constitution gives him uh, tenure for life or good behavior. I would submit that having pleaded guilty to something that is obviously not good behavior means that if uh, he won't resign, we have to act and we ought to act expeditiously. That was my point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. I yield the Sup thank you. I, I still have the time. I yield the gentlewoman from California. I thank, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner. I am not on the task force, but I, I hope, I don't know anything other than what I read in the newspaper about this. Obviously, what he was convicted of is terrible. He should go to prison. He shouldn't hear any cases. I don't think there's any dispute on that. I did read, however, that, and I don't know if this is even true, that the individual suffers from bipolar disease. And that is, mental illness is a real disease. And I hope that the task force will consider and weigh whether or not that, in fact, is the case if there is a disability well, claim. And I, I would yield back to the gentleman. Yeah, well, rec reclaiming my time, uh, the fact is is that the judge did plead guilty to one count of obstruction of justice uh, and dismissal of the other five counts against, uh, against him. Uh, bipolar disease is a, a disease, but I don't think it allows someone who should be held to a higher standard, meaning a federal district judge with a lifetime appointment, uh, to be able to commit crimes and basically continue drawing would, salary would, while he's in prison. Would the gentleman yield? I'm glad to yield the gentlewoman from California. I, I agree with you. I, the fact that he, uh, if, if in fact he is uh, mentally ill, it does not excuse criminal behavior, and he has, in fact, been convicted of that. The question I am raising is whether his mental illness is grounds for, for disability retirement. And I don't know the answer to that, but I just hope that it is well, one of the issues that the task force Well, rec reclaiming my time, that decision will be made by Judge Jones as the chief yeah. judge of the Fifth Circuit. Uh, it will not be made by us. Uh, the question is, is whether uh, he has forfeited the ability to be a federal judge because he's no longer in good behavior. And Would I think the answer yield? to that is obvious. Uh, I'm Would happy, the gentleman yield? I'm happy to yield. I, I yield one question. additional minute to Mr. Okay. Sensenbrenner. Now I'm thoroughly confused. Um, I had thought that an impeachment would eliminate uh, any disability pension. Is that correct? Uh, reclaiming my time, the answer is yes. Whereas his conviction did not do that? Uh, uh, reclaiming my time, the answer is no. And we did impeach and the Senate removed 20 years ago. Oh. Judge Walter Nixon of uh, uh, Mississippi, uh, who was drawing a full salary. Right, but but, but the, que the question I have is, I, I was listening to the dialogue between the gentlelady from uh, mm -hmm. California and, 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 and Mr. Sensenbrenner, and I gathered from that that you thought that uh, the, the, ta that the, the task force should make a determination as to the equity given his mental illness of his collecting a disability pension. Oh, man. And now I hear that the, the, the impeachment, if we were to go forward with that, would eliminate that. And so that would eliminate their ability to make that determination. The no. question is on adopting the resolution. Mr. All in Cameron? favor, who seeks recognition? For how long? One minute. All right, the gentleman is granted. Well, Mr. Chairman, it, it is reprehensible for a judge to take advantage of female employees and grope them. Um, and I don't think somebody like that ought to be on the bench, but in view of recent events in here, I'm concerned. If it turns out that's how he's oriented sexually, uh, are we moving toward a hate crime here in this body? Uh, I yield back. All right, then I'll give uh, Congressman Schiff a minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I won't even take a minute. Uh, just to say I support the resolution, and uh, Mr. Goodlatt and I have been working uh, very well together in a bipartisan manner. We'll explore all the relevant issues and work as expeditiously as possible, and I yield back the balance of my time. The question is on adopting the resolution. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no.
The ayes have it and the resolution is adopted. Pursuant to notice, I call up H.R. 848, the Performance Rights Act, and ask the clerk to report the bill. H.R. 848, a bill to provide parity in radio performance rights under Title 17, United States Code, and for other purposes. Uh, without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Could I begin this by uh, suggesting that uh, the time has approached for finally establishing some form of equity for recording artists, allowing them to be paid fair compensation for their creator creativity. Uh, this is not a revolutionary concept. Uh, everybody gets paid for their creativity and their work. Uh, in my offices uh, in Washington and Detroit, I'm being flooded with calls by people who have some misimpression of House Resolution 848 that I hope that we can clear up in the course of this discussion. Uh, I, I, and I am equally concerned about the economic impact that the measure before us may have on broadcasters, particularly smaller broadcasters, particularly minority smaller broadcasters. As, as difficult as times are, it is certainly not the intention or goal of this legislation nor of this committee to uh, make economic opportunity more difficult for anybody, particularly bank well, uh, broadcasters who may be on the, the in a difficult circumstance uh, as it already is, even before the glo global fiscal crisis has engulfed us. Uh, and that's why uh, I, and I can speak for a, a number of members of the committee that have uh, talked with me about this, we are committed to finding some middle ground on this issue. I believe we can accomplish both keeping smaller broadcasters in business and bring some equity to performers uh, for the first time uh, in the in terms of terrestrial radio uh, that they've ever had. Uh, now, along with my colleagues, we'll be offering a manager's amendment, that glorious legislative product that addresses several of the concerns that have been raised at our hearings and the subsequent many meetings that we've held, including last night, this morning, and all during the last few weeks prior. This manager's amendment provides a number of accommodations, including delaying the bill's effective date, reducing the royalty payments due, and ensuring that the needs of small minority, religious, uh, gospel, non-music broadcasters are taken into account. Now, today's markup is not the end of the legislative process. I, Lamar Smith, and others remain ready and willing to work with all interested parties in developing any necessary accommodations that may be required. The only thing we ask is that you're working with us in good faith. And, and I'm also asking, uh, requesting, along with Ranking Member Smith and our dear colleague from Texas, Sheila Jackson-Lee, uh, Judge Gonzalez, Mr. Chaffetz, uh, Lundgren, and others, a GAO study to analyze the economic factors for radio broadcasters as well as performing artists and copyright owners related to this act. This doesn't mean that we do not have enough information to, to move the bill forward, but that as we move forward, we can and should supplement the information available to the rate-making authority. 
I plan to remain diligent in ensuring the vibrancy and the competition available in the broadcast and other relevant markets. The last thing any of us want to do is preside over a broadcast market that becomes more concentrated and less diverse. We want deconcentration and more diversity. And so I'll be working with subcommittee chairman Hank Johnson, ranking member Lamar Smith, subcommittee ranking member Howard Coble, and others that are as deeply interested in this as I am in planning uh, a hearing on this subject in the very near future. It's an, uh, an important and emotional issue for many. Uh, it's an economic issue for many. Uh, creative rights go to the core of our cultural health, our intellectual prowess and as a, as a society. And broadcasters are a vital cog in our local communities and in our political debates. Uh, so with that, I'll submit the rest of my statement and invite Lamar Smith to make any comments that he, he may want to as soon as he finishes talking with Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The constant tension in copyright law is to balance the recording artist's interest in being compensated for their works with the benefits derived from being provided with greater public ac access by broadcasters. The bill before us today, H.R. 848, represents a historic change in copyright law. It proposes to alter the relationship between performing artists who benefit from having their sound recordings performed over the air and local radio stations that have always benefited from broadcasting such popular works. The bill amends sections 106 and 114 of the Copyright Act and eliminates the exemption from paying recording artists that AM and FM radio stations have enjoyed since the development of broadcast radio. There clearly is a symbiotic relationship between radio stations, record labels, and recording artists. The intended parties should recognize that they depend on each other and begin to work toward a resolution of their long-standing disagreement. While I don't expect the parties to begin negotiating on a rate, the parties did publicly agree to cooperate on negotiating the scope of an objective study. This study was intended to be completed in the next few months so that it would help members of this committee make adjustments to this legislation. Today, the chairman and I and several other members of the Judiciary Committee are sending a letter to the Government Accounting Office that request an expedited review of the economic implications of various proposals involving performance rights. That letter is also signed by Charlie Gonzalez, Dan Lundgren, Sheila Jackson Lee, and Jason Kafis. And Mr. Chairman, may I uh, ask unanimous oh, consent no. that a copy of that letter be made a part of the record? Without objection, so ordered. Despite the fact that this issue has been around for many years, the sad truth is that there is an absence of credible and objective economic information that can inform the members of this committee about the likely effect of enacting this legislation. For example, it isn't clear whether older artists are likely to be net beneficiaries of such a royalty or whether instead radio stations will drop them from their playlists in favor of newer and more popular artists who are still under active recording contracts. It would be a tragic result of a bill that is intended to improve the lives of some artists actually resulted in less public exposure and therefore a lower quality of life for those who have brought much joy to so many. I understand the desire to advance this legislation, but remain convinced that haste may lead to unintended consequences. But I do appreciate the steps the chairman has made to improve this legislation. However, I urge my colleagues to recognize that there is still much that we need to know and other improvements that might be made to this bill if we gather evidence and better inform ourselves about its likely consequences before we consider it on the House floor. Because I do not think we have sufficient information regarding the effect of this legislation to justify such a dramatic change in the law now, I am unable to support the bill. But with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, uh, Lamar. Uh, we now turn to amendments. I ask the clerk to report the manager's amendment. Amendment to H.R. 848, offered by Mr. Conyers of Michigan, Mr. Isa of California, Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas, Mr. Johnson of Georgia, Mr. Watt, and Mr. Rooney of Florida. 
Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and I will begin the discussion by pointing out that these five of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, have offered this manager's amendment as a good faith, sincere attempt to address specific concerns that have been raised by broadcasters, members, civil rights communities, radio listeners, uh, in an effort to reach middle ground. The amendment goes a long way to help small broadcasters especially. In addition to the accommodations for the small broadcasters in the underlying bill, the manager's amendment, the measure before us, goes even further. Now, stations making under $100,000 a year will only have to pay uh, $500 a year. This accommodation will cover 90% of the minority-owned stations and 77% of all stations. To account for the difficult economy we find ourselves in, the manager's amendment also delays the effect of the bill for three years for stations grossing under $5 million a year and delays it uh, for one year for stations grossing $5 million or more a year. The manager's amendment also directs the copyright royalty judges in making determinations about the rates to consider the effect on religious uh, stations, non-commercial stations, minority-owned stations, female-owned broadcasters, uh, uh, all of whom should be given a very careful attention as we uh, deal with this very sensitive uh, matter. My particular thanks goes out to the general lady from Texas, Sheila Jackson Lee, a distinguished member of this committee, for working with us on this important provision. It also directs the copyright royalty judges to look at the effects of non-music programming and its importance. We will be calling on the GAO to conduct a study on how this bill will affect minority-owned stations, female-owned stations, religious stations, gospel music, minority royalty recipients, and uh, religious royalty recipients, among other things. There are significant concessions that have been brought along, uh, been brought to, to gain this support from the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, the uh, labor community, um, unions across uh, the spectrum, AFL, SEIU, CWA, Steelworkers, American Federation of Teachers, uh, AFSCME, and others, artists, uh, such as that are supporting us, such as Harry Belafonte, Duke Fakir, uh, Jerry Butler, Dion Ferris, Dion Warwick, Sam Moore, Crystal Waters, John Sakata, Martha Reeves. Who's there? Uh, who's there? Duke Fakir, he's in the audience. And uh, uh, we, we hope that this amendment will be uh, carefully considered as the managers have worked on it equally as carefully. I recognize now Lamar Smith, our ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the manager's amendment contains a number of improvements that are intended to address some of the concerns that have been expressed by representatives from the broadcast community. In particular, the tiered rate structure tied to station revenue and the delayed effective date for payment of royalties for a period of one to three years will provide additional flexibility and an adjustment period for any station affected by this legislation. However, these new provisions are another reason why the bill would benefit from negotiations before it reaches the House floor. I welcome the Chairman's commitment to make further improvements and look forward to the results of the GAO study that we requested today. While I intend to support the manager's amendment since it improves the bill, I still cannot support the underlying legislation given what we do not, that we do not know enough about the bill's potential impact 
Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. The, the, the chair recognizes Mr. Howard Berman. Chairman, who seeks recognition? Uh, uh, Mel Wap, the uh, subcommittee chairman on finance, a senior member of the Judiciary Committee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I move to strike the last word and um, rise in support of the manager's amendment. Um, uh, the members may note that my name was added as a co-sponsor of the manager's amendment um, uh, at the last minute. In fact, it's written in as a uh, co-sponsor of the manager's amendment because uh, I've been um, evaluating uh, how to move this bill in the direction uh, that uh, protects uh, broadcasters more, uh, as particularly small broadcasters. And uh, while I'm not certain that um, the manager's amendment goes all the way um, uh, in that direction as far as uh, it might be necessary to uh, get to the right balance, it certainly moves the bill in uh, an appropriate direction uh, that addresses a lot of the concerns that uh, uh, were either rightly or wrongly uh, being uh, raised by uh, those in the broadcast community. So um, I'm um, uh, certainly strongly in support of the manager's amendment <laughs> and uh, would join the, the chair and other members who um, uh, express an interest in continuing to um, listen to all parties to make sure that uh, um, the balance that we are getting to and have gotten to in the manager's amendment, uh, if it's not the appropriate balance, uh, we continue to work on it and uh, find a resolution that um, 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 is the appropriate balance. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, thank the Chairman for his hard work on the manager's amendment. Um, I think it uh, substantially improves the bill and addresses a number of the concerns that, uh, that I had about the bill, um, uh, or at least substantially addresses those concerns. And uh, with that, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Chair recognizes the former Chairman of the Agriculture Committee, senior member of Judiciary Committee, Bob Goodlatte of Virginia. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for working with me and others about uh, some of the concerns that we have with this bill. And while I still do not believe that the bill is yet finished, I am pleased that the manager's amendment moves in the right direction and I will support it. The manager's amendment further reduces the statutory rates that small broadcasters will be required to pay. Specifically, it sets lower statutory rates in tiers based upon the station's revenues. The amendment also starts the process of ensuring parity in the treatment of royalty rates among various technologies, including Internet, satellite, and terrestrial radio. I'm particularly pleased about two provisions that I worked with Chairman Conyers to get into the manager's amendment. The first is the extension of the effective date for stations that make $5 million or less in annual revenues. Under the amendment, no such station will be required to pay royalties for three years. This will give broadcast stations much needed time to attempt to prepare for these royalty payment obligations. In addition, the manager's amendment contains my provision to require the copyright royalty judges when determining royalty rates for public performances of sound recordings to consider the effects on non-music programming, including local news and information programming among clusters of stations within a local DMA. I, I have and continue to be very concerned about maintaining local radio programming. Local radio programming is one of the best and least expensive ways that citizens gain access to news and emergency information in their community. At a time when consolidation seems to be the norm, I believe it is important to do what we can to encourage radio stations to continue to provide local news and information, which often is done at cost or at a loss to the radio station. In addition, many local radio markets have local owners who own and operate multiple radio stations. These clusters may contain some stations that bring in large revenues, as well as some stations that bring in no revenues, such as local stations dedicated to news and information. It would be a shame if this legislation were the last straw that caused station owners like these to make the decision 
to close their shops, sell out, or cut their provision of robust local news and information coverage. The inclusion of this local programming provision in the manager's amendment will ensure that the copyright royalty judges take into consideration the effects on local programming when they determine royalty rates. This is a good first step in our attempt to ensure that local programming remains robust even after stations are required to make royalty payments for the performance rights in sound recordings. I thank the chairman for its inclusion. And in closing, I still have some concerns about this bill, and I hope we can continue to work on it after today to make sure it sufficiently protects small broadcast stations and local programming. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Goodlatte. Chair recognizes the chairwoman of the Subcommittee on Immigration, Zoe Lofgren of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Uh, without objection, the gentlelady is recognized. Uh, as I've stressed throughout our hearings on performance rights and this legislation, establishing platform parity and the underlying purposes of copyright should be the guiding principles when addressing this issue. And I am grateful to the chairman, as well as Mr. Berman, for including language in the manager's amendment that moves towards these principles. Currently, there are four different types of radio operating in the United States, terrestrial, cable, satellite, and internet radio. And of the four different platforms, the latter three all compensate singers and performers for the use of their music. The Copyright Royalty Board is the government entity responsible for determining the rates that cable, satellite, and internet radio will have to pay. And they use a four uh, factor test outlined in Section 801 of Title 17 uh, to establish the, the rates for cable and satellite. But, it, but for recording rates for Internet radio, there is a different test, a, a more rigorous, a higher threshold commonly referred to as willing buyer, willing seller. Uh, under the 801B standard, satellite and cable radio pay around 6 to 8 percent of annual gross revenue but under the willing buyer, willing seller standard, internet radio pays at least 47% of their gross revenue in the form of support royalties. And in some cases, that figure has exceeded 80%. In the year 2008, uh, Pandora's sound recording obligations totaled 70% of their gross revenues. And so I think that this is really a quirk in the federal law at the time uh, that internet radio was in its infancy, infancy. Now, I am grateful that Section 801B has been uh, included, included in, the, um, in this model as a standard for parity. I think it is um, a fundamentally balanced one that, ap that appropriately reflects the purpose of copyright to encourage the production of creative works for the use and enjoyment of the public. That being said, I would have preserved the last factor in 801B, which examines the effects of royalty rates on different industries. And I would also have drafted the text to ensure that small webcasters enjoy the same solicitude that the bill shows for small terrestrial broadcasters. I really can't think of a reason why we would, and I, I understand and support the limit of $5,000 for a small bread, uh, webcasters but at the same time, uh, I mean small uh, broadcasters, but at the same time, small webcasters could pay up to $150,000. So I understand this language moves us forward. I support the language in the manager's uh, amendment. I am appreciative of the work that um, Mr. Berman and Mr. Conyers have done with me to move us forward. I am hopeful that as we proceed further, we can have additional discussions on why there would be a cap for terrestrial and not for webcasters. I think there's plenty of opportunity to have those discussions. And uh, as I have told Mr. Berman, I uh, look forward to continuing to work uh, with him uh, so that artists are treated fairly, but also all platforms, and most importantly, the public is treated fairly. I know a goal that you well, share as well. And I would yield to the gentleman. Well, I, think, I thank the gentlelady for yielding, and I want to make a, a couple of points in uh, the follow-up on what you said. Number one, I think you are absolutely right. Platform parity between webcasters, between internet radio, satellite radio, 
and terrestrial radio should be our goal. Um, secondly, I mean, the biggest make, I, mistake I made in my effort to try and achieve platform parity in the Perform Act was not including terrestrial radio. And I'm sure the general lady would agree that the greatest distortion of the principle of platform parity is the total exemption that over-the-air terrestrial radio now has, uh, where it is the only one does not pay uh, for the performance right. Um, and so, uh, but on, on the issue of the small broadcasters and small webcasters, the next bill we consider will allow the agreement between the music folks and sound exchange and the small webcasters to supplant the negotiate the the board decision which charged the rates that you made some reference to in right. your earlier comments so we on that issue we will be addressing that in effect, if, right after we finish this bill. If, if I may reclaim my time, I am a co-sponsor of that bill, and I look forward to it being adopted. But I would note, I would ask unanimous consent for an additional minute. General lady, lady is uh, accorded two additional minutes. Uh, I, I would note that e even though I support that measure, it doesn't provide the kind of statutory protection to small webcasters that we are providing to small broadcasters today. And I think that that's something that we should think about no, doing here. Uh, just to, if I may just add, it, it, you're right, but what it does do is allow a negotiated agreement between the small webcasters and, and sound exchange to supplant a uh, decision that some felt was very onerous on small webcasters. And, but we also, I think we continue to work together to strive for the kind of platform parity where you have a compulsory license. Uh, reclaiming my time, I would just note that um, you know, we could say the same thing for terrestrial broadcasters. Let them you know, work out the deal. And the problem is that the small guys inherently end up with less bargaining power. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's why we put in. Generally, uh, given two additional minutes. That's why we put in the limit for the small broadcasters, which I support. And I, and I think that we ought to consider, and I want to continue talking to you and the chairman about a similar measure for webcasters to protect them just as we are protecting the small broadcasters. And I do agree with you that, and the reason why I'm willing to proceed supporting uh, the measure at least today is that it hasn't been fair to the others. If there's platform parity and one entity pays nothing, that's not reasonable, but this, this is the time to be fair to all. And uh, which is something I'm sort of a, a broken record on this, but this is our opportunity to make this equitable across the board. Little lady's time has expired. And I yield back. Chair recognizes Howard Coble, uh, the senior member of the committee from North Carolina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, colleagues, as we all know, this bill would eliminate a lot the long-standing exemption for over-the-air broadcasters from paying a copyright royalty to performers. Last session, Mr. Chairman, I worked very closely with the distinguished gentleman from California and Mr. Smith, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I voted in favor of the bill, which addressed the performers being, quote, shortchanged, end quote. I believe the performers have the better equitable argument. Fast forward to today. The economic, the dismal economic climate bothers me now, and, so, and, and some of these particularly the small station, it would be a negative impact. And with that in mind, Mr. Chairman, I commend you for the manager's amendment. Would, would the gentleman yield? Well, let me keep, and I will just a minute. Mr. Chairman, I want to, as we say down home, you've done good in, in, in crafting this. It's obviously a better improvement. I talked to a performer yesterday, known to most of you in this room, and he knew I voted for the performers last year. And I told him, I said, in view of the economic downturn, this year I'm leaning more toward the broadcasters because of the negative impact that would be, uh, that they would suffer. That has been assuaged somewhat by your manager's amendment. I'm, I, and he, uh, then he said to me, he said, regardless of how you vote, I'm still your friend. 
Mr. Chairman, I almost fell out of my chair because most of the responses have been, well, by golly, you better vote for this bill or you better vote against this bill or you'll regret it. Here's a guy who came forward, use your judgment. And that's what I'm gonna try to do. I want to associate myself with the comment made by the general, uh, distinguished gentleman from Texas in that I think we need more data. Uh, I think that the time to pass it to today perhaps might be premature. Having said all that, we'll strike that. Not unlike many of you, I have sweethearts on both sides, the broadcasters I love, the performers I love. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But Mr. Issa from California asked first, though, so I will yield my, well, he's already gone. I'll yield to the gentle lady from well, California. Well, thank you. I just wanted to introduce a note of um, celebration to this because two hours ago, our colleague on the committee, uh, Linda Sanchez, uh, brought into the world a baby boy Joaquin Sanchez Sullivan. And so we are very happy for her. He's very, uh, he is very healthy. She is happy. And we, our love goes to her and to Jim. Well, let me reclaim my time. Mr. Mr. Chairman, this, this is a very significant piece of legislation. Uh, I am told that the process uh, has continued. Uh, the negotiation continues. Uh, I am furthermore told that, and I don't know this for a fact, but that the performers have been more uh, accommodating in the, in the negotiation process than have my best radio station friends or the spokesman, therefore. I don't want to penalize the, the owner of the small station in Michigan or in North Carolina for the failure of some folks up here who, re who refused to negotiate if, in fact, they did refuse to negotiate. The process continues. I hope we see the rainbow at the end, at the end of the, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. Mr. Chairman, I hope it won't be another train coming our way. But I thank you and I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman expresses uh, many of our sentiment uh, in, in the quest to seek equ equity on both sides. Mr. And, Chairman. Uh, and I must say that uh, I was talking to Linda Sanchez late yesterday evening on the floor <laughs> and she said any day now John but I didn't had no idea how correct she was nor did she <laughs> chair recognized Mr. Sheila Jackson Lee the distinguished gentle lady from Texas thank you very much mr. chairman and um, you just uh, offered um, the words to a song any day now, so I'm, I'm glad to be uh, the lead for that. Congratulations to Linda Sanchez. I like what um, my colleagues have said, um, and I like my good friend from North Carolina, Mr. Coble. Uh, we have friends everywhere. In fact, I'm looking into the audience, and I'm seeing uh, friends that I have respect for that are advocating both positions. Uh, in the midst of uh, this discussion and debate, uh, my uh, cell phone is um, joining my office phones and being blown up by those who are, are hearing that it is represented that I am destroying um, small and minority-owned businesses uh, by engaging in this legislation. And so I think it's important, uh, first, Mr. Chairman, to thank you for your leadership and uh, the leadership of gentlemen from California and others. And I've been delighted to work with you because I think this committee is about fairness and equity and justice. Uh, and that's all we're asking for today. Uh, and if there's anyone uh, capturing any of our remarks, uh, let it be known that um, the records of many of us and most of us uh, could not be challenged as it relates to protecting minority women and small businesses. Check our records. Our love and affection for our radio stations, uh, the National Broadcast Association, uh, is also impeccable. Uh, we are supporters of their ability to achieve the right to use the First Amendment. But I think we've got something going here. And in my discussions that I've had, I'm glad that there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And the light is that um, we're operating under a framework that started in 1909. We're now in a new century. Uh, and all this bill does, as I have come to uh, have it digested, is it puts a framework forward. Uh, and I like my friends. Uh, I know there are good people in Iran and China and North Korea, uh, but I'd like to get out of that camp 
uh, I'd like to be able to come into the camp of the rest of the world uh, that believes in the performers' rights. Iran, China, and North Korea are the only other countries that do not allow or pay for performers' rights. That's not the company right now that I want to associate myself with. So what does the manager's amendment do that makes me feel that we're on the right track? And frankly, uh, I believe that we can do better. Uh, and I think the chairman has been very generous in trying to work with individuals. Uh, but I know that I've been glued to late night TV looking at the Rockets uh, handle themselves with L.A. And we're going to do it. And I know that as I look at it, somebody's being paid for showing that game. Somebody's being paid right now if there's a baseball game on. Because that adds to the viability of that product that the radio station is producing. So all we're doing today is asking that the people that inspire us, uh, that cause us to uh, take a stand for the person we believe in as it relates to faith, that gives us comfort uh, as we drive to work or uh, maybe we're disturbed at work and we turn on the radio of any kind, terrestrial, um, cable, satellite, internet, and regular broadcast, that we can provide for those individuals. So in the name of Archie Bell and the Drugs that came from Fifth Ward, Texan, Texas, the Winans that spent a lot of time in Houston, particularly at a New Light Christian Church, of which I am always a frequent visitor, Yolanda Adams, who sung at the Sojourner Truth event, Kirk Franklin, who is, uh, along with Yolanda, a dear friend of mine, the Clark sisters, Herbie Hancock, of which we've all grown up on listening to his, his music, the Miracles, of which had a sweet sound that we enjoyed, you never could top Jerry Butler and Harry Belafonte, cool in the gang. Martha Reeves, of course, and with Martha and the Vandellas. And uh, as I told Duke uh, of the Four Tops, we always could understand what they were saying. Um, I would say to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, that um, I've had, uh, uh, as they say, some uh, interesting calls uh, over the last couple of days. And all the folks have called. I love them dearly. I listen to the morning talk shows. Um, I pay tribute to Tom Joyner and uh, my good friend Al Sharpton. I pay tribute to them, but I want them to know that we can do much sitting around the table of negotiation. And so it is important to note that my KTSU with Texas Southern University, University of Houston Public Radio, are all in uh, the realm of paying a set fee. And this manager's amendment allows them to pay $500 annual fee for all stations, uh, under $100,000, $1,000 for annual fee for religious stations, publicly supported, making more than $100,000. And 2500 uh, $2, for those over that amount, 5000 for the commercial stations. But I'm very glad, Mr. Chairman, that you understood that we really don't General know how much. General Lady is uh, given an additional it. minute. I thank the Chairman. That we don't really know how much this is going to cost. And these are the questions that I raised. Kept asking for the numbers, but we really don't know what it's going to be because I think the point should be made that it's going to be negotiated. The copyright judges are, are going to work to negotiate, copyright royalty judges, what the fee is going to be. So we have signed a letter with my colleagues, uh, Lamar Smith, myself, and uh, uh, Chairman uh, Conyers, and have the language in the manager's amendment that says uh, that the copyright board will take into account um, the idea or the issues facing minority-owned, female-owned, and religious stations. Radio One, which is so popular in Houston as it is elsewhere, Magic 102, uh, that is promoting the idea that we are killing small businesses, praise that is promoting the idea, will be protected under this language. So, Mr. Chairman, let me um, conclude by simply saying uh, that I want to get out of the bad, bad neighborhood and get in the good neighborhood, work with the performers, work with the broadcasters, and do the right thing, because the Constitution says that the First Amendment should be protected, and I look forward to doing so in the balance of protecting our small and minority-owned businesses. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I uh, thank Mr. you. Chairman. We have time to recognize the distinguished gentleman from California, Darrell Issa, before we go to vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I want to thank you today as a co-sponsor of the bill and a co-sponsor of the amend manager's amendment for the kind of work you've done. It is very unusual here in Congress for one side to negotiate with itself so many fine compromises. I guess some people in the audience know it was a one-sided negotiation. <laughs> and, and, and it's very hard to do that, to try to be fair to concerns that are brought up 
even though no matter what the would, would, would the gentleman you just on that comment of course i yield to california man was it a one sided negotiation because the proponents of the bill wouldn't talk to the other side no vice at all and in fact that has been the frustration as my colleague from california points out that those of us who believe that there that the right answer can never be automatically zero have not had a partner to negotiate with but notwithstanding that mr chairman you have done a fine job of listening to all of us try to find things which we believe will improve this bill bring it to what should be the willing buyer willing seller negotiation if the broadcasters would simply terrestrial broadcasters would meet with us and particularly with platform parity bringing in the interest of people who today pay royalties who believe that they should be allowed to have similar royalties to those who who today pay nothing but are not asking for nothing they're just asking for parity and so the efforts taken in this amendment i believe is something that should cause those who have been absent to realize that we've gone i believe mr chairman as far as we can go on a one sided basis and perhaps as far as we should go even if we had that other partner at the table with us so mr chairman i won't take any more time because i know our time is short but very few people ever will get the credit they deserve I as chairman hopefully today we all appreciate that you have done something that i haven't seen a chairman do in my uh, tenure here and i commend you for it and look forward to working with you uh, for the completion of this bill and the signing ceremony. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Well, I have an opportunity. And I'd to yield to the lady from California. Uh, well, I have an opportunity to speak when we return. Before well, we take over. I think we can do it now if you'd like. I'd like Maxine. to, uh, Mr. Chairman. Chair, is with great pleasure, recognizes the distinguished gentlelady from Los Angeles, California. Thank you very Maxine much, Mr. Martin. Chairman. Uh, today's markup of the Performance Rights Act of 2009, H.R. 848, represents a tremendous amount of hard work by you and my California colleagues, Mr. Berman and Mr. Isaac, to resolve an issue that has remained unsolved for a number of years. Technological advancements that have brought us into a new vi digital age have highlighted the fact that our copyright laws must be updated to reflect the reality on the ground and in cyberspace. This committee has the responsibility to update the copyright laws to reflect, reflect the fact that musical performances are shared today in ways that were ne never envisioned when the copyright laws were last updated. Over the years in my congressional district in Los Angeles, I've spoken with many performance artists and broadcasters about their concerns regarding the need to find a fair way to compensate everyone for their work. Let me be clear. I do believe performers should be paid for their work, but in modernizing the statute, we must be very careful to avoid action that would diminish the voice of minority broadcasters. Corporate mergers have already had a devastating impact on small to medium-sized minority radio broadcasters. I don't want to make that problem worse with a burdensome new law. I believe we can um, come up with a solution that doesn't hurt small or minority broadcasters, including religious broadcasters. Mr. Chairman, I certainly commend you for your efforts to bring this bipartisan proposal before the committee today. No bill is a perfect bill, and rarely is a bill enacted exactly as it is introduced. But H.R. 848 provides us with a good starting point, and I'm looking forward to working with you and would like to work with you and my colleagues to improve this bill in a way that will provide fair payments to performers and impose the least burden on broadcasters. That's why, Mr. Chairman, I'm a little bit disappointed that we're taking this bill up and marking it up today. This manager's amendment certainly is a reflection of hard work that's gone into trying to reach a practical compromise to a complicated issue. The topic of performance rights pits some of our nation's most prominent industries against one another, and the impact that these various industries have on our country's economy with regard to creativity. The dissemination of arts and entertainment and innovation is tremendous. The changes embodied in the manager's amendment go a long way towards striking an appro uh, appropriate balance between the competing interests of the key stockholders on this issue. However, while representing a vast improvement to the underlying bill, 
additional changes are still warranted mr chairman in spite of all the changes that have been made to improve the manager's amendment i'm concerned that our good intentions will have unintended but devastating consequences on minority and local broadcasters late last night i heard from a station that broadcast in my district k k l a f m k r l a a m i'd like to enter their rec letter into the record today but i'd also like to share two key points that they raised first they pointed out even stations with revenues under one point two five million will suffer greatly with the minimum tax of five thousand as the rate is determined not as a percentage of profit but on revenues and these tough times profit margins are shrinking to evaporating even with the fifteen percent staff layoff he said we are forced to implement last year we already pay over two hundred sixty five thousand per year for music license fees and of course he says please don't increase our burden more uh... my local broadcaster made another point that was raised during our hearing earlier this year and i'd like to quote him he said why should foreign owned record companies who control seventy five percent of all record sales benefit at the expense of locally owned and operated businesses radio stations are struggling to survive as are most businesses in the u s right now this massive wealth transfer out of the u s economy to these foreign owned record companies will destroy many local radio stations costing uh... jobs and revenue in our local economy i would have liked to have time to explore more the percentage of these fees that will go to the record companies as being a stated by this broadcaster but let me just conclude by saying this one of the reasons i want more time is i certainly want to be able to compensate the performers compensate the performers but let me remind you that as an african american woman as a minority in the congress of the united states who needs to communicate with her constituents as many of you do coming from small towns coming from minority communities you don't have access to the big corporate media you're not on the sunday shows they recycle about five or six people uh... on the house side and five or six people on the senate side every sunday morning on these corporate television shows and these big radio shows yeah. my opportunity to educate my constituents yeah, yeah. and to communicate with them lies with these small broadcasters these minority broadcasters these little religious stations and i'm not willing to sacrifice that at this time the reason that i'm here is to do the will of all of the people and if my constituents don't have an opportunity to talk with me because the big copy of media doesn't care what i'm saying or maybe what you're saying either mr chairman i think we need to back up and take a look at this i yield back the balance of my time mr. i chairman. thank the gentle lady and mr. could chairman. not uh, concur with her more we we now have we find that we've turned the clock back we now have enough time to recognize steve king for the final comments uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I will compress this, and I appreciate being recognized at this moment. I agree with the gentlelady from California. I would like to have more time to work on this, too, for many of those same reasons. And uh, I wanted to make uh, a couple of points here that I asked the, the committee to consider, and that is we're addressing a situation that's been argued that, that the radio stations aren't required to pay for the fr actually the programming that comes, and the artists are not being able to collect for that. That's the center of this argument. There's another side of this argument, which is that the performers and their record labels get free promotion from the radio stations. So when you balance this on either side of the equity scale, there's an argument for each side of this. This bill seeks to correct just one marginal free market flaw that exists, but it does not address the other free market flaw, which is to allow the, the terrestrial radio stations to collect for the promotional value when they play the product. And so this is a kind of a situation that once, if this legislation would pass, and I support the manager's amendment, it's an improvement, but if this legislation would pass into law, then we would be setting up a new principle without correcting the free market wrong that exists, and that's the de facto prohibition for, for radio stations to receive uh, payment for their promotional value. I think we need to provide equity on both sides of this scale before we move forward. I would urge... Uh, consideration to delay this and ask for more time. Again, reiterate, Gentleman I agree Yale. with the gentlelady from California, and 
um, then I wanted to also make a point that um, if we'll do a hearing on black radio stations, I hope we can bring in some other radio stations to be heard from rather than identifying it on, on minorities. And I, I, I would, I'll would i yield back because the chairman would the gentleman yield? to yield to the lady from Texas, but I'd yield back in the interest of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. He, he said he'd yield back after you were yielded well, to and, and I thank the gentleman. I just want to emphasize this is a work in progress. Uh, this is this is a work in progress. You've made some valid points. We're all thinking in the same ways. The chairman has been enormously generous about this work in progress, and and I truly believe uh, that this does impact all radio stations. We've made great strides, but we cannot allow uh, an inequity in the copyright laws uh, to imbalance our work for our broadcasters. Our broadcasters will be heard, and we will work with them. I yield back. The committee will stand in recess until the three votes have concluded, and then we'll immediately resume.